All right, welcome to our Sunday morning service. For those uh, not from this church and who are watching online, my name is Pastor Chris Guys, and I'm standing in for uh, uh, Reverend Johnson, uh, who is having a well-deserved uh, break from preaching. I've titled my message this morning, uh, How to Miss the King's Arrival. But first, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate this third Sunday in the Advent season, we are mindful not to miss your presence. You see us in all of our messiness, and yet you came for us by sending us your blessed Son, Jesus. Our dear Lord Jesus, you dwelt among us, and you still do. Emmanuel, God with us. And from the moment we awake to face the day ahead, you walk with us. Your presence is enough for our needs, and therefore every day we will praise you. We are blessed because we have received a king, but not like the kings of this world. O oh Lord, our king, you are a king of true power, and that power is grounded in love. Love has its very source in you. It flows from you like a river into a world that does not perceive it. But like any river, your love will not be thwarted. Your love will always persist, finding its way around and through the toughest of places, creating space for a miracle. We acknowledge that we are unworthy servants, unworthy ambassadors of your love. And yet the power of your love transforms each one of us, bringing us always to the foot of the cross where we receive forgiveness, redemption and hope. For these things we are truly grateful. Amen. Okay, I'd like to now invite uh, Ben to come up and uh, bring us today's reading, which is taken from today's alternative lectionary reading. Thank you, Ben. Good morning, everyone, and I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday. Um, it's great to have Chris with us and to just have such amazing men of God to come and bring the word of word for us. It's Mary's song from Luke 1, 46 to 55. Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. For he has been merciful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. But he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. But he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel remember to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers, Wow, cool. So we'll get Chris back now to um, share with us his message for this. Can't wait. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Ben, for reading that. I want to begin uh, this morning's message with an illustration. Now, some of you may have heard uh, this one before. Years ago, there was a very wealthy man who, with his devoted young son, shared a passion for art collecting. And together they travelled around the world, adding only the finest art treasures to their collection. Priceless works by Picasso, uh, Van Gogh, Monet, and many others adorned the walls of the family estate. The widowed father would look on with satisfaction as his only son, his only child, also became an experienced art collector like himself. However, the day came when war engulfed the nation and the young man left to serve his country. After only a few short weeks, his father received that terrible telegram that no parent wants to receive, that his son had been killed while carrying a fellow soldier to a field medic. 
and he was, of course, utterly devastated. Then one morning, an unexpected knock came at the door of the old man's home, and as he opened the door, he was greeted by a soldier with a large package in his hand. He introduced himself to the old man by saying, Look, I was a friend of your son. I was the one who he was rescuing when he died. May I come in for a few moments? I have something to show you. Yes, yes, please, please come in, said the old man. I am an artist, said the soldier, and I want to give you this. And as the old man unwrapped this big package uh, that the, other, the, young, the young man was holding, the paper gave way to reveal a striking portrait of his son. Now, although art critics would have never considered this particular work as a sample of genius, the painting did indeed feature the, old, the, the young man's face in wonderful detail, and it seemed to capture his personality rather well. So the old man was absolutely uh, delighted with this picture. Now, the following spring, the old man became ill himself, and eventually he passed away. Now, the art world, at hearing news of this, became a buzz with incredible anticipation, because according to the will of the old man, all his revered artworks would now be auctioned. Now, the auction day soon arrived and art collectors from around the world gathered to bid on some of the world's most spectacular art, pe art pieces. But the auction began with a painting that was never going to be on any museum's list. It was, in fact, the painting of the old man's son. So the auctioneer asked for the opening bid. He said, who will open the bidding with $100? The room was silent. Minutes passed by with not a sound coming from the, from the audience. And then from the back of the room, someone called out rather callously and they said, who cares about that painting? It's just a picture of this old man's son. Let's forget about it and go on to the much more important paintings. There were other voices which echoed in agreement, but the auctioneer replied, no, the rules of this auction are that we have to sell this painting first. Now, who will take the sun? And finally, a friend of the old man spoke up and he said, look, I knew this boy, so I'd like to have it. I will pay the $100. I have a bid for $100 called the auctioneer. Will anyone go higher? After a very long silence, the auctioneer said, the auctioneer said, going once, Going twice, gone. The gavel fell. And cheers filled the room and someone was heard to say, now we can get on with the real auction. But the auctioneer called out and he said, no, the auction is now over. What? Stunned disbelief filled the room. Then someone spoke up and asked, you know, what do you mean? What do you mean it's over? We didn't come here for a picture of some old man's son. What about all these other paintings? You know, there are millions of dollars worth of artwork sitting right here. We demand that you explain what is going on. Well, the auctioneer replied and he said, look, it's very simple. According to the will of the father, whoever takes the son gets it all. And right there, in that very moment, is the essence of the story of Advent. Whoever receives the son gets it all. It's an incredible gift. Whoever gets the son gets the lot. The Apostle John put it like this. He said, this is in 1 John 5 verses 11 and 12, he said, God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. You see, the one who has the Son has it all. And so from our reading uh, this morning that uh, Ben has read to us from Luke 1, verses 46 to 55, I'm just going to touch on it briefly again. We find Mary waxing poetically with these words. She says, His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. 
He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now, think about this. These words from a passage in the Gospels, as Ben mentioned, which is known as Mary's Song, are words which describe someone who has power and authority. Indeed, these words sound like something that would be ascribed to a king. And indeed, they are. And so with this idea of framing our exploration, I want to ask you this question. Who is the real king in your life? Is it you? Is it someone else? Or is it Jesus? Because there is no doubt really in my mind that as you lean into this life that is unfolding in front of you, that the challenges that you will face will force a decision from you one day or another as to who that king will be. You or Jesus? Now, I want to segue briefly here to talk about success. Alongside another measure, which is used, that of power, the world often measures success through one's ability to acquire wealth. But is this truly a measure of success? You will, of course, never take any wealth that you have with you when you cast off from this mortal life. But for us in the West, I want to challenge the, the thought, the assumption that wealth can ever really truly be used as a measure when it is clear really, particularly in the West, that most of us are already wealthy beyond all comparison. And you might say, look, what are you talking about, Pastor? I know plenty of poor people, I feel poor myself. What are you talking about? Well, I want you to consider really how rich you are. And that may sound strange, particularly as I know many of us are very used to telling each other just how tight things are. But did you know that if you have some Band-Aids, uh, a little medicine, some purified water, that you are better off than most of the people in this world? And you might think that's crazy, but consider this. Here in Australia, most of you enjoy breathing the rarefied atmosphere of the richest 4% of the world's population. It's amazing, but it's true. We often think that because we don't have the latest things, the newest phones, a car made in 2020, you know, the, if you're lucky, the best sports gear, the coolest clothing labels, that we don't have much and that we're losing out on all the good things that life can give us. We might even consider that we ourselves aren't worth much because of the things we don't have. That maybe we'd be better if we, uh, happier if we just had that one thing that we're missing. So in December of every year, we religiously trot out our wish list to address that perceived problem. And you know what? There is an incredible irony, a deep irony within our current cultural moment during this Advent season. This onslaught of buying more and more lands right on the very doorstep of the very day in which we celebrate the impoverished and lowly birth of our God and our King. It really is incredibly ironic. But the reality is, the birth of the Son of God has been hijacked. And just like King Herod, the modern world says to Christians, Oh! You have a religious celebration on that day. Tell me more about that, because I really want to join you in that worship too. But something is terribly wrong. They don't want to worship with us. They simply want us to support their empire. And so huge corporations then use the holiday to make as much money as they possibly can. But here's the thing. One of the choices that we all have to make in life is deciding whether to invest in the eternal or to invest in the things of this world. 
And that can be an incredibly hard decision to make when there is so much around us that glitters before us. And especially so if you are young, if you are smart, if you are attractive, you know, the world is your oyster, so to speak. But let me tell you that not all pearls are the same. In Matthew 13, Jesus talks about a pearl of great price, one so valuable that you would sell everything else just to possess it. And so talking about the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ enters the world scene for a very particular purpose. And all amidst the shining splendor and the glitter and gold, Jesus comes into the world to tell us a better story. And his story has the possibility of changing everything, of changing what we care about, of changing what we hope for and what we will imagine. Our King tells us this story lots of different ways, but here's the simplicity of what he says. He says that this life is very broken and we all need saving and that he is the saviour. He tells us that what many people place their hope in to rescue them isn't going to do it. He tells us that enjoying God matters the most because it is the only thing that can bring us real hope in the long run. He tells us that we're only here for a little while, so we should do the things that matter most in this world. And he tells us that how we love God is expressed best in caring for other people, particularly those who are poor. In contrast, of course, the world values stuff. What can be acquired, what can be worn, what can be eaten. But Jesus tells us not to worry about any of this, but instead to consider how we can honour others, how we can show kindness to others, and how we can steward the things he gives us for the sake of others. And in this season of Advent in particular, maybe one of the ways that we could steward our resources a little better that cares for other people might be by protecting our own family from the terrible pain of debt, which for some families lasts all year. And then it starts all over again, year on year. So back to our story from the Gospels. Jesus is now on the way, Mary is singing about it, and Herod will shortly hear about it. Now Herod, he was the then current proxy king set up by the Romans to oversee Palestine. And when he hears of this coming king, he is deeply troubled. And so he assembles a bunch of eggheads to verify what's happening and they find this prophecy in which a ruler is said to come out of Bethlehem. So wily old Herod, he then commands these wise, wise fellows and he says, go and search for this child as best as you can. And when you find him, be sure to send word of his exact location so that I can go and worship him. And we might go, hmm, really? Worship him? You know, if it all sounds a little bit fishy, it's because it really is. You know, at first, Herod is deeply troubled, along with all of those who are in power in Jerusalem. And the very next moment, he is basically saying, hey, be sure to tell me where this new king is, because uh, I want to worship him too, which is, of course, a lie. You know, basically, if you haven't worked this out already, Herod is not a good guy. Here's a quick sketch of what Herod's like. You know, from a worldly point of view, you could sum it up with words like impressive, effective and successful. His kingdom was one of size and wealth. His crowning achievement was the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. And part of the brilliance of his worldly power was that he gave the religious crowds exactly what they wanted, specifically the building of this new temple. But he also became a paranoid tyrant who ended up killing three of his sons on suspicion of treason. A famous quote from Caesar himself was, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. Herod had everything and it still wasn't enough. He had everything and yet he had nothing, which is still a theme that plays out in today's world. And his life was also defined overall by anxiety and fear. 
Now, it's funny how those two things go together, having everything, and yet because of fear and anxiety, you actually end up having nothing. You could be the wealthiest, most powerful person in the world and still be dom dominated by anxiety to the point where it just chokes the life out of you. You know, passage in Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8 and verse 36, puts this very well when it says, And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Now, compare this to Mary and Joseph, who quite literally had nothing. They have their baby in a barn, and yet they truly do have it all. They have the one through whom all things were made. They are bringing the life of God into the world, even though not many people are paying attention. No fame, no money, no power, and yet it is the most important moment in history up to this point in time. You know, it's hauntingly familiar. A paranoid leader says, hey, let me know where the baby is so I can worship him too. And like many, he will use any kind of rhetoric, even the language of worship itself, to get what he wants. And right after this, this paranoid leader would create a policy based around his fear and anxiety that would result in the death of a village full of babies. Right at the heart then of the Advent story is a baby who poses such a threat to the most powerful man in that area that he kills a whole village full of other babies just in the hope of destroying this one baby whom he fears the most. Wow. Incredible, isn't it? You know, when you think about it in this way, Advent really starts to sound more and more dangerous, doesn't it? The lesson then is this. If you want to find God in the story, don't go to the temple built by the king for the, for the religious establishment because he's not there. He is to be found in far humbler places. Indeed, it is an ironic, really, that as the religious crowds followed the power and the fame of Herod, just nine kilometres away in a barn, the king is found by those who are paying attention. And so I would say to you, if you're listening to this message and you're not feeling like the right kind of Christian, quote unquote, you know, you're in very good company. The right kind of Christian in this story is on the wrong side of history. The religious establishment sided with Herod and his empire and they completely missed Jesus. They completely missed the Messiah. And so the story of Advent invites us to seek the truth, to be discerning whenever religion and power begin to mingle, and to not be satisfied with mere religious goods and services, but to look in the out-of-the-way places to see where God is truly working. So be different. Be different. Mark Twain once said, whenever you find yourself on the side of the majority, it is time to pause and reflect. That's good advice. And so to everyone listening here uh, online this year, I invite you to ignore the signs and the symbols of the empire. I invite you to not give in to the advertisers of the corporations that really don't want to worship with you, but who will use the language of Advent to lure you into supporting their own empires. And I invite you, most of all, to find this king who is literally changing everything. Don't miss him. Do not miss him. And I believe that as we seek out our king, as we celebrate Advent in this way, that we can be in sync with the God who is still in the business of changing the world. And may we also recognise that having it all is to not have it at all. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Loving Father, thank you for giving us a king. May we not miss his arrival, past, present or future. To those of us who find him, he brings us a message of true peace, joy, hope and love. 
So may we follow this King all of our days. May we serve him and him alone, seeking where he is already at work in this world and aligning ourselves with his interests always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So again, the Lord entered the world as a baby, but he was born a king. And today, some 2,000 plus years after his birth, this king still reigns in our hearts and in our minds if we will seek him out and follow him. One day, and I really do hope it is soon, he will, he will come again to reign over all the earth as king of kings, as lord of lords. And when he does, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess him. So there we have it. Now, before we conclude, can I remind those of you who uh, wish to support our work here in this church and online uh, through in our YouTube and our Facebook channels to please send in your gifts and offerings using the details that we publish on our website uh, and in other places which are known to uh, church members. And let's, let's pray for the offering. Father God, Father, you give us life. You give us the very breath in our lungs. We are indebted to you in ways we can, can't possibly imagine. You give us gifts. You give us the opportunity to steward the things that you have made. And dear Lord, just simply by that alone, we are uh, tasked to manage those gifts wisely. We are tasked to share those gifts. We are tasked to think of others with our gifts. And so as we bring our gifts to you in whatever manner or form that takes, whether it is in the form of money, whether it is in the form of time or uh, other things, Father, we pray that you would multiply these things and that you would use them to bless your kingdom, that the gospel of salvation will be broadcast to the whole world. And in our case, that we will have influence in our community right here. And we thank you for the privilege of serving you in this way. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And I want to conclude actually with one more prayer before I give you the benediction. So let's, let's do that once more. Father, it has been an incredibly hard year. 2020 will go down as one of those years that people just want to forget. But as the words of scripture, which Ben read to us this morning, echo in our hearts and in our ears, we rejoice because the arrival of your blessed son has profoundly altered the course of human history. To all who will receive him, joy has truly entered the world. So we thank you. In the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So I want to bring you the blessing before we conclude from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 23 and 24. May God himself the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. Thank you for watching.